One of the things that fascinates me the most about astronomy is the scale of the universe. Everything we can see in the night sky, with the help of some of the most powerful telescopes ever built, is literally billions of years old. And outside of our own galaxy, it's all millions and billions of light years away. The term light year in and of itself is pretty mind-blowing. Space is so huge that even light, the fastest thing we know of, needs an incredibly long time to cross the enormous distances between sources of light, be that stars or galaxies. In our own stellar neighborhood, the light emitted by the sun takes four years to reach the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Collective light from all the stars that make up our Milky Way takes two and a half million years to reach Andromeda, the closest galaxy to ours within the so-called local group of galaxies. If right now there was an intelligent species looking at our galaxy and they somehow had equipment powerful enough to find our tiny planet orbiting our small sun embedded in one spiral arm of the Milky Way among millions of other stars, they would look at a green and vibrant planet full of living beings, but humanity's distant ancestors have just barely begun to straighten their backs and look out over the tall grass of the African continent. We can't possibly imagine these kinds of distances. We can work with months and years and decades, but anything over a hundred years old already starts to feel vague and far away from us. Our brains simply didn't evolve to truly understand anything that is longer than a human lifetime. And even a human lifetime is barely a blip. And even the entire history of our species, which goes back some 300,000 years, merely the blink of an eye compared to cosmic timescales. Everything you see is in the past, because the speed of light is finite. Even the photons bouncing off the mirror take a moment, albeit extremely short, to cross the distance between the glass and your eyes. Looking up at the night sky with the naked eye, most photons coming from the stars have been traveling for at least a few thousand years. If you're lucky and you're in a truly dark area, and you can spot the very faint little blob that is the visible light of Andromeda for the unaided eye, those photons have crossed a cold and empty part of space for two and a half million years. That's for sure something to consider when stargazing, that this light left Andromeda when not a single human had ever existed, and the oldest human species were most likely not capable of pondering those tiny lights dotting the curtain of the night. Thanks to powerful machines such as the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope, we can capture light from objects that formed just a few million years after the Big Bang. The origin of the universe, 13.8 billion years ago. The Hubble Deep Field images are famous for causing a bit of a revolution in astronomy, since they were the first to reveal the distant past of the universe and teach scientists many things about that time. The telescope itself is already an incredible feat of science and engineering, a few centuries in the making. Galileo Galilei, who was the first to build telescopes for astronomical observations, could never have imagined people in the 20th century building a telescope the size of a bus and then putting that thing in an orbit around the Earth by means of enormous and powerful rockets. Let's also keep in mind that modern digital imaging and computing makes an image like the Hubble Deep Field possible. The telescope fixed its gaze on a small, seemingly empty patch in the sky for 10 days in 1995, with a total exposure time of over a hundred hours, allowing in plenty of light from when the universe was still young. The result is nothing short of astonishing. Almost all the galaxies you can see in this image are at least 12 billion years old, and so the photons captured by Hubble have been traveling through space for that long. There's no telling what these galaxies are like right now. We can only see them as they were when their light left on its journey into the depths of time and space. We can't really wait another billion years and recapture a deep field to see how these galaxies have evolved over time. All we can really do is take the snapshots of the universe's past and compare that to what we see in the universe today. And that's how scientists can try and piece together how the universe grew and evolved. Hubble is still a great telescope for observations in the visible and ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum, all the wavelengths of light and how much energy they have. But the much more advanced James Webb Space Telescope was specifically built to capture light in the infrared range, low energy light that has been coursing through the universe since the time the very first galaxies formed. 
light in all its wavelengths, from extremely high energy gamma rays down to low energy deep infrared waves, is how we can study the universe, and how we can know how stars and galaxies form and evolve. The kind of holy grail of the ancient past of the cosmos is finding the oldest starlight that still travels space. Ancient photons forged in the hearts of collapsing clouds of hydrogen and helium. Atoms that were formed in the primordial rage of the infant universe, shortly after the Big Bang. At this time, James Webb has not yet confirmed any light coming from the first stars, and scientists suspect not a single one still exists in the nearby universe. By studying our Sun and other nearby stars, we have a pretty good idea of how they form and evolve in the current age of the universe. Gravity pulls clouds of mainly hydrogen and helium together, until the pressure and temperature at the center become so intensely high that nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium begins, and so the star begins to shine. Most stars in the current universe are on the smaller side, so-called yellow dwarfs like our sun. But the majority of all stars are the even smaller and rather dim red dwarfs. Even the biggest red dwarfs have a luminosity of only about 10% that of the sun, and so not a single one is visible from Earth with the naked eye. They're too far away and don't shine bright at all. Most stars visible in the night sky are the much bigger and brighter stars, blue and red giants many times heavier than the sun. But all things considered, massive bright stars are quite uncommon even though they do stand out the most. The mass of a star matters for its longevity. Low mass stars can last for trillions of years, while the most massive stars burn through their fuel in only a few million years. The higher pressure in their cores caused by their huge mass makes that they burn their fuel at a higher rate. Live fast, die young is their motto. In the universe as we know it today, clouds of gas that birth stars are still mostly made up of hydrogen and helium, but they are laced with all sorts of heavier elements, like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, silicon, iron, copper, gold, in short, heavy elements that are the building blocks of all stars, planets, and life as we know it. Hydrogen and helium and tiny amounts of lithium formed right after the Big Bang because these atoms are the simplest. A hydrogen atom is just one electron circling one proton. So it's obvious to see why this element is the most abundant in the universe. And a helium atom consists of two electrons circling a core of two protons and two neutrons, and sometimes two protons and one neutron. Every other element that we can find in stars today, in the gas and dust in deep space, in every planet, comet and asteroid, and every living being on Earth was forged by nuclear fusion under the immense temperature and pressure in cores of stars that no longer exist. At the end of their lives, they blew their outer layers away, spreading these precious elements all around. The heaviest stars exploded in a supernova, leaving behind remnants that literally warp space-time itself black holes and neutron stars. Collisions of neutron stars are so violent, they're the reason elements like gold and platinum exist. Temperature and pressure in stars never gets to the point gold can be formed. This can only happen on the rare occasion two neutron stars collide, usually because they're already orbiting each other since they formed as baby stars. In the entire Milky Way, out of all the 100 billion stars, scientists estimate there's only about 10 neutron star binaries destined for a collision at some point. If you happen to have any gold jewelry, know that this shiny metal only exists because extremely dense and heavy stellar corpses smashed into each other sometimes during the past 12 billion years. Now this is in the current universe, in our own galaxy, which is easiest to study in detail. Most stars that exist in the Milky Way are younger stars, so-called population 1 stars like our Sun, which contains between 2 and 3% heavier elements, or metals, keeping in mind that in astronomy any element heavier than hydrogen and helium is considered a metal. So stars with a higher metallicity are younger because they contain quite a lot more metals than the older population 2 stars, which generally have a metallicity of only 0.1%. These stars formed at a time when metals were still rare, because not enough stars had exploded yet to spread these heavy elements across space. Population 2 stars are extremely old, and were born back when the Milky Way was still forming, 13 billion years ago, and some of them are even older than that. One of the oldest stars known, and a likely candidate to be the oldest star we've ever found, is HD 140283, also known as the Methuselah star. 
It's only about 200 light years away from Earth, and that makes it a good subject to study population 2 stars. Older estimates of its age put it at almost 16 billion years old, but that would make it older than the universe, and that's not possible. More recent studies put its age at about 14.46 billion years, with an error margin of about 800 million years, so that could make it as young as 13.6 billion years. It must have formed fairly shortly after the Big Bang, but since it does contain some metals, it's not one of the first stars, but it may be one of the first of the second generation that still roams the Milky Way. Stars don't exactly come on a birth certificate, so one thing scientists can do to determine the age of a star is study the spectrum of the light that's coming from the star, or any source of light in the universe. Dark lines in a spectrum of a star are all associated with a certain element. These are called Fraunhofer lines, and they're caused by certain elements absorbing some of the star's radiation at these specific wavelengths. Certain elements absorbing certain wavelengths of light can be reproduced in a lab, and so that's how scientists know, and that's also how the element helium was discovered in 1868, when scientists found a line in the spectrum of the sun that they couldn't associate with any known element at that time. Astronomers also studied the intensity and brightness of light coming from a star, and they used the combined light captured by several telescopes set up in an array to get more detailed imaging of a star or any object in space that emits electromagnetic radiation. Now, even then, you still end up with an error margin, but still close enough. As it is, population 3 stars, the very first stars to ever exist in the universe, remain shrouded in mystery. One of the Webb telescope's main objectives is finding evidence of these stars, and the telescope's sharp gaze can peer so far back into the universe's past, it may have already found them. In 2015, the Hubble Space Telescope detected the at that time youngest and most distant galaxy ever found. Webb has now found galaxies even further away, but it has also been used to study this one dubbed GN-Z11 in more detail. Astronomers measure large distances by determining the redshift of an object. Redshift is a phenomenon caused by the expansion of the universe. Every distant object we can see appears to be moving away from us because its light is stretched out to longer, redder wavelengths as it travels through expanding space to reach our telescopes. GN-Z11 is a surprisingly bright infant galaxy and its light reaches us from 13.4 billion years in the past when the universe was only 430 million years old. Because the universe expands, this galaxy is at a proper distance of about 32 billion light years. Studies using web data have shown that this galaxy's unexpected brightness may be caused by the luminous accretion disk of a supermassive black hole at its center, making it the farthest active supermassive black hole spotted to date. Another discovery was a gaseous clump of helium in the halo surrounding GN-Z11, and this clump appears to be pristine, without any heavier elements polluting it. And so this cloud may be where clean gas has collapsed and formed population 3 stars. The helium clump glows because something is producing huge amounts of ultraviolet light. The amount of high energy radiation required to ionize all that gas is about 600,000 solar masses worth of stars shining with a combined luminosity of 20 trillion times that of the sun. The source of all this light may be coming from some of the first stars that have ever existed, and so this clump of helium may be leftover material of those stars' formation. Still, actually finding some of the first stars is much like looking for a needle in a cosmic haystack. The Webb telescope has proved to be vital to find ancient objects, and these observations teach us that galaxies started to form earlier than scientists had expected, and they seem to contain fewer metals than anticipated. Just to be clear, this doesn't mean that everything scientists have been saying about the origin of the universe is wrong, it's just like with sensitive instruments like the Webb telescope, they can gather better data and make better estimates of what the early universe was like. No other telescope that came before Webb has been powerful enough to capture the ancient photons coming from the first galaxies to have ever existed, so it's actually not surprising that there are a few surprises. In fact, this is awesome for scientists. When unexpected discoveries are made, that means that they can get to do more science. That being said, scientific theory on the origin of the universe and stars and galaxies is pretty solid, so it would take something completely new and different in order for scientists to have to completely rework the theory. 
For now, more data still needs to be gathered and more observations made because there are still a lot of uncertainties when it comes to those early days of existence. Cosmology is the study of the observable universe's origin, the origins of stars, galaxies, and other large structures, what the ultimate fate of the universe is, and how it all works. And while there are still unanswered questions, all the data and evidence collected and studied so far do point at the Big Bang Theory being the most likely explanation for observed phenomena, including the abundance of light elements, such as hydrogen and helium in the universe, the size of the universe, and the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, by doing a lot of complicated math, doing experience, and running computer models, scientists know that hydrogen and helium were the only elements formed right after the Big Bang, with such tiny amounts of lithium that you can pretty much ignore these atoms anyway. And so they can make an educated guess on what the first stars would have been like, and they were quite different from stars that we can study nearby in time and space. Aside from traces of lithium, they contained no metals at all, and while astronomers are quite certain what these stars were made of, they're not so certain of their size. They may have been extremely massive, bigger than any star we know of today. Some of the most massive stars in the nearby universe are found in the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and they contain up to 220 times the mass of our Sun. The first stars may have contained 300 up to a thousand times the mass of the Sun. One reason scientists believe Population 3 stars were so huge is because massive stars live shorter lives. And since we haven't found any metal-free smaller stars so far, it's reasonable to say the first stars were likely absolutely gigantic. More evidence pointing in this direction comes from simulations of large clouds of hydrogen and helium, plus the gravitational influence of dark matter, and how these clouds could cool and collapse to form stars just a hundred million years after the Big Bang. They were probably extremely hot and bright as well. A star a hundred times the mass of the Sun, for example, would have a surface temperature of around a hundred thousand Kelvin, and shine with the energy of one million suns, mostly in the ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. If the first stars truly were these extremely hot and luminous behemoths, not a single one would have existed for very long. Even a star only 60 times the mass of the Sun doesn't last much longer than about a million years. We can imagine beacons of searing light setting surrounding clouds of gas blaze for only a few hundred thousand years to then burn out, explode, or collapse. Maybe that's exactly what we're looking at in the halo of GN-C11. Huge metal-free stars may see a different end than stars containing metals. We can observe and study nearby supernova remnants, neutron stars, and black holes. But the unique properties of extremely massive Population 3 stars make that they may have exploded in a strange and rare type of supernova, called a pair instability supernova. Inside a stellar core, the outward pressure of nuclear fusion pushes against the inward pull of gravity, making it all even out and stable. The nuclear fusion inside the cores of supermassive stars produces a lot of extremely energetic gamma rays under the enormous pressure of their mass. These gamma rays interacting with atomic nuclei can form pairs of opposite particles, in this case specifically electron and positron pairs with opposite charges. This process reduces the amount of gamma radiation because the energy goes into forming these particle pairs. And so this causes a partial collapse, since less energy in the core makes that the crush of gravity can win momentarily and increase pressure on the core. When an electron and a positron meet, they annihilate each other, and this produces energy in the form of gamma rays again. So the pressure in the core rises even more, and energy production increases even more. And this causes a runaway process that results in a supernova that leaves no stellar remnant behind. No neutron star, no black hole, just the star's material that gets blown out into space. And this can only happen in extremely massive stars with virtually no metallicity like Population 3 stars. The very biggest metal-free stars could even have collapsed directly into a black hole without exploding at all, with all of their mass contained in the black hole, and so these stars would not have contributed any matter to form any new stars. These black holes may have been the seeds of the supermassive ones we find at the centers of galaxies today. 
This is what physics and computer models can tell us, and if we're very lucky, we might catch a glimpse of some of the first stars that have ever existed, but even with a very sensitive instrument like the Webb telescope, it would be very difficult to see individual stars that far back in time and space. The ancient galaxies Webb has found so far likely contain first-generation stars, but even these baby galaxies contain hundreds of thousands to millions of stars, each at different points in their life cycle. Today, population 1 and 2 stars exist at the same time, and in the distant past, some of the first stars existed alongside the next generation of stars formed from metallic dust scattered throughout young galaxies by the first supernova explosions. Now, maybe you've wondered why stars and galaxies exist in the first place, why matter in the universe has clumped together and formed things like stars and atoms, for that matter. According to our current understanding of physics, just after the Big Bang, the young universe went from a quadrillion degrees in that first moment, down to only 10 billion degrees within the first second, and during this time, the established laws of physics may not have applied. Gravity, the electromagnetic, and strong and weak forces emerged at this point and would dictate how everything in the universe works and interacts with each other. Physicists suspect the universe inflated exponentially for a brief moment, between 10 to the minus 36 and 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. And yes, that's over 30 zeros after the point. And the inflation theory explains the origin of the large-scale structure of the universe, with all its clusters and superclusters of galaxies. Quantum fluctuations, tiny ripples in the universe at this early stage are believed to be the basis of these structures that would form much later. These smallest seeds would become overdensities that would in time make that matter could clump together and become the foundations of the first galaxies and later clusters and superclusters and galactic walls. If these fluctuations didn't happen, there would be nothing in the universe except an ever-thinning homogeneous mist of hydrogen and helium atoms. Thanks to gravity, however, the fluctuations became gathering points where huge clouds of gas would collect, contract, and eventually light up. Three minutes after the Big Bang, the first hydrogen atoms formed, and the first helium atoms formed through nuclear fusion in the intense heat of the infant universe. After 20 minutes, the universe was no longer hot enough for nuclear fusion, so nothing more than helium and small amounts of lithium were fused out of hydrogen. But it was still too hot for neutral atoms, so it contained a dense, foggy plasma of negatively charged electrons, neutral neutrinos, and positive atomic nuclei. Essentially, a hot soup of particles bouncing off each other for the next 377,000 years. When the universe cooled down to just a few thousand degrees Kelvin, something amazing happened. It was finally cold enough for the existing atoms to capture the free electrons. Their charge then became neutral, and so they could fall into their lowest energy state. By doing that, they released energy in the form of photons that could now travel freely through a universe that was transparent for the first time. These photons can still be detected as the cosmic microwave background radiation, and this is the oldest direct observation we have of anything happening in the entire history of the universe. Those released photons would have filled the universe with a brilliant pale orange glow at first, but as time passed, this glow faded out of the visible spectrum of light, and the universe would have been truly dark until the first star started to shine. The ancient light of the cosmic microwave background reaches us from so far away in both space and time, the wavelengths having been stretched out by the expansion of the universe, and we're so far removed from this event that we can only detect these photons using extremely sensitive instruments. To our eyes, the space between stars and galaxies seems completely dark, but by using machines that can detect long wavelengths in the microwave range of the electromagnetic spectrum, scientists were able to make a map of the cosmic microwave background. This phenomenon had actually been predicted as evidence for the Big Bang Theory, and was discovered in the 1960s. Now, after decades of study, the oldest light in the universe is an important source of data on the primordial universe. It allowed scientists to determine the age of the universe, and by studying the small fluctuations in its temperature, they learned about the origin of galaxies and the large-scale structure that we can observe in the cosmos. And it provides insight into the composition of the universe as a whole. Ordinary matter, stars, galaxies, planets, and what all of us are made of seems to make up only 5% of all matter that exists. 
Dark matter, good for about 27% of everything, does not interact with ordinary matter except through gravity, making it incredibly difficult to study. The remaining 68% of stuff is for now dubbed dark energy and seems to be responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe. But as it is, scientists are not sure what dark matter and dark energy truly are, and these are some of the biggest questions still remaining in modern cosmology. The Hubble and Webb telescopes have shown us glimpses of the early days of the universe, when galaxies were still irregular clumps of infant stars containing almost none of the heavy elements that makes we can exist and study ourselves, in this incredible place we find ourselves in. We can wonder if planets and even life were at all possible this long ago, since life as we know it requires a decent amount of specific elements. Still, could an intelligent civilization survive long enough that they can say their distant ancestors witnessed the last of these mythical first stars? Like how we look at the Methuselah star as a relic of a past we can just barely make out with our machines. By some inconceivable coincidence, we happen to be alive in a day and age our technology allows us to know so much about the universe and its origins. Perhaps this epoch is the perfect one for life to exist and develop intelligent beings capable of a deeper understanding of everything that happens. It may not have been possible before, and the future is uncertain. If the universe continues to expand forever, light will no longer be able to cross the ever-growing distances between galaxies and clusters. The cosmic microwave background radiation, that first light to travel freely and carries the echoes of the beginning of everything that exists, will fall out of reach of anyone looking back in an attempt to find answers. There would be only darkness as far as any eye, organic or machine, can see. If maybe some distant descendants of humanity still exist in a much colder and darker era, they might tell stories of our yellow sun and our glittering night sky full of nebula and giant stars and spiraling galaxies, and whoever is listening could never truly understand, because they would know only their reddish island galaxy, full of aging red dwarfs, adrift in a sea of nothing. For now, however, we get to enjoy our time and place in the universe as it is, on a small blue world brimming with life caught in the light of a star that couldn't have existed without a few ever so tiny fluctuations in the fabric of existence when it was less than a fraction of a second old. The past teaches us where we came from, but the future is in our hands, because the present is where we find the tools, means, knowledge and willpower to build it. Thank you for watching, I hope you learned something new today and I will see you soon.